I think we could probably get started. Yeah. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, well, hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the up meeting this month. Um, thanks for being flexible with the changes. Um, go ahead, Charles. Okay. Um, well, first off, uh, we'd like to welcome all of you for attending. Uh, please uh, feel free to participate, speak up, ask questions, contribute as you see fit. If you have not joined the nurse user Slack, then please be sure to join it as well to stay up to date with any news and meetings. Um, to start off today, uh, we'll do a little bit of introductions, um, introducing myself and Lippy, who uh, will be basically facilitating and overseeing the the meetings um moving forward and uh we can I'll, i can provide a, a brief introduction about myself um and lippy too uh, so i am actually a new um consultant at nurse i joined last month um a part of the user engagement group i am a so a science engagement engineer and hpc consultant um, working with the community to create a community of purpose and foster more interaction and collaboration. So that will be the goal that both Lippy and myself will be working on. And a little bit of background about me. Um, my background is in performance modeling and optimization of scientific applications and energy aware computing. Uh, my PhD is from Texas A&M University. And uh, my background uh, in industry includes uh, doing development work with uh, IBM for their parallel platforms, as well as Oracle. Um, and I'm located here in Atlanta. And the past three years, I've been working in the startups team, seen as a consultant, uh, working with a, a number over a dozen different uh, startups as a technical advisor and consultant here. Uh, before joining nurse uh, i'm not i'm not new to the doe labs as i previously also worked at uh oak ridge and, and livermore lab as well but i'm um, glad to be working with everyone at nurse and all of our, our users and looking forward to working with everyone moving forward should so i go ahead and introduce myself yeah um, so I think some some of you may have seen me before. Um, my name is Lippy. I was up until recently a postdoc at NERSC and have now transitioned into a staff position as uh, also as a science engagement engineer. So Charles and I are going to be working very closely, um, which is very awesome. I'm glad to have him here with me. Um, my background is actually in physics. So I did my undergraduate degree in physics at Cornell. I did my PhD in physics um, at University of Chicago. And um, I also did um, some research at Slack National Lab, which is where I became a NERSC user. Um, up until that point, I didn't know what NERSC was, and I'd never done any type of high performance computing. Um, and then once I became a NERSC user, I just became really interested in scientific, um, like computational work. Um, and that's how I ended up joining NERSC as a postdoc. Um, so my background is much less on the computational side. Um, and so in this role, I'm really looking to represent the scientists who are, you know, who, who are using uh, HPC resources, but don't come from a computing background, um, who, you know, might have slightly different needs or different levels of, of uh, familiarity with resources and hoping to bridge any gaps um, and also just make the process of using NERSC as scientist um, a little bit easier. Um, so yeah, so that's uh, a little bit about me. I'm also remote. I don't live in California. I live in Oregon, uh, in Corvallis, Oregon, if any of you are familiar, uh, it's where Oregon State University is. Um, and yeah, I think that's kind of it. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to working with uh, all of you and with our users. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, and I'm I'm so happy to be working with Lippy. Uh, already, we've come up with a couple of great ideas, so we're looking forward to bringing those to light moving forward. And also, although technically I am new to nurse as a employee, 
Um, I'm not new to NERSC as a user because it is the first supercomputing center that I had access to as a graduate student at Texas A&M. So it feels good to be working with um, our community of users, just like uh, I had guidance when I first got into HPC and um, parallel performance modeling as well. So we'll continue on uh, today with um, just an overview. Um, here you can see our plan for today and with the win of the month and what you learned, um, as well as a few announcements about quarry retirements and calls for participation. And then we have our topic of the day, which will be Julia at Nurse um, as well. So let's go ahead and uh, get going, I guess. Okay, and so for this, what we wanna just do is have anyone that wants to share something that they have achieved over the, this month um, as related to anything um, in your research or using uh, the platforms. Um, it could be if you have a paper accepted or you're working on a paper or you're you know, presenting a poster or attending a conference, if you, had a milestone breakthrough and solving a bug or whatnot, or or any other uh, achievement that you like would like to share. Uh, so, do we have anyone that would would like to be open to sharing? Hi, this this is Robert Ryan. I could mention something. Hello, awesome. from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I'm an accelerator physicist and. Uh, last week, uh, I was able to use, uh, I was on Cori, and I managed to simulate a process uh, from first principles uh, called uh, self-amplified spontaneous emission. And that's something that happens when an electron beam and a free electron laser pass through an undulator, and a coherent signal grows out of noise. And... Uh, Self-amplified spontaneous emission had been, it has been uh, simulated for many years, but I don't believe it's ever been done from first principles before. <clears throat> and I tried to do this uh, a few years ago and failed, so I was very happy that it worked last week. Awesome. And I have, uh, I put some things uh, online in the project workspace if anyone is interested. Uh, and I've also been posting about this uh, on LinkedIn. So if anybody looks me up on LinkedIn, you, you can see what this is about. You have a, a a point of what do you feel was the the point that gave you the breakthrough or what's the turning point for you? Uh, I think the breakthrough was that I, I realized that I could uh, use uh, some... Uh, Alternate alternative algorithms to what I had been using previously, and that the these other algorithms turned out to lead to a, a code that was both faster and more robust. Okay, awesome. Well, wow, that's great. Um, thank you so much for sharing. And you know, my background is in performance optimization, so. I would basically work with a, a researcher or a physicist like you that does um, acceleration and help to optimize um, your your algorithm for you know better parallelization or even better execution on a GPU. So you know if if anyone's having issues like that, I would love to get together and have a discussion so we could see what might be going on. And that's basically what my PhD work was, it was optimization of scientific applications from weather simulations to gyrotorial codes to improving them for predicting performance, uh, reducing execution time and energy aware optimization as well. So lots of, you know, areas that something like you just, just made a breakthrough on could be applied for improvement. So awesome. That's and definitely a win. Oh, and in fact, this code is, uh, so far, it's still CPU only, but the next natural step is to move it to the GPU. So yeah. happy to hear you're there and able to 
help assist, I mean, help make, uh, make the transition to GPUs. Definitely awesome. Wow, that's a, now that's a great win. Can anyone follow up with that? Oh, yeah. Um, this is Koichi from Piano Now. Hi. Uh, I just got my uh, one paper accepted. Uh, uh, this is a uh, paper about uh, climate models. And this is not really scientific, but uh, discuss uh, technical aspects of this uh, particular series of simulations we produced. Mm -hmm. And so basically provide enough information to reproduce our simulations as well as uh, enough details for the data users to be aware of. For example, you know, we compare model simulations to other observations and we know what part of the Earth's climate this model has weakness or we call biases So the users has to be careful. But one of the most interesting uh, aspect of this paper is we provide some challenges of running this climate model code on the uh, recent HPC systems. Uh, this is, I ran simulations a few years ago on Cori night landing. So at that time, no, it's not about GPU, but it's more about the vectorization and uh, specific memory usage on mm -hmm. those heterogeneous you know, CPUs, you know, connected to different memory units in, in on KNL. And we found out very common kind of model, uh, it's called CSM, is very slow on night landing. That's not unique to this CSM code, but uh, many code uh, actually slow, run slower on night landing than even previous uh, supercomputer here at Edison. And then, so I dig out uh, several literature published by NASC support uh, staff, NASC, NASC scientists, and including publications under NISAP for KNL. Uh, because this NISAP, does include some sub-models in the CSM, uh, like some smaller routine or kernel, and then optimize that for KNL. But that does not propagate into the main branch of the CSM. So we're trying to point some modelers to those issues, uh, particularly the code written by domain scientists are very poorly uh, written in terms of the, you know, loop uh, order or uh, its specialization and the other memory management. Mm -hmm. And then also in supplement, we provide another aspect of the challenge is that the, uh, for our production queue waiting time. So with the help from Steve Leake, actually he's a co-author for this paper, we made a, a 2021 average queue wait time on Corey Haswell and Corey Night Learning as a function of uh, requested hours and requested number of nodes and providing what kind of workflow would be make it easier to run climate scale simulation, particularly within the three years funding cycle, which is getting more difficult if the code runs slower. So um, I might put the link on the preprint. Actually, I presented this uh, this story or theme about a year ago in this NASA meeting, and now finally it's published. So it might be still interesting to some of you, but next challenge is obviously to, to use how to use GPU for those kind of model code. And I was just I forgot to turn on my camera. Anyway, that's all. Thank you very much. Hey, awesome, awesome. Well, congratulations. Um... Well, so it was you were able to incorporate uh, uh, the alternative algorithms that work better on the system than the previous version that you had. Uh, not uh, as a group, yes. I am not a core developer, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we've been aware of one of the issue is the CSM has very poor memory scaling. Uh, mm -hmm. So each task storing unnecessary unnecessary global arrays. So as you more going more higher resolution, the less efficient the memory is being used. And another part of the model already has GPU enabled version, slightly older uh, 
code base. But so the next step for me is to really uh, port that GPU enabled version to Parmata and then see how fast it can run. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, to make sure that we stay on track with time, we're gonna go on to our next um, area, but wow, those are already two great wins. If you have any others, then please feel free to go ahead and share in the chat too. Um, another um, area is um, what, to, did you learn anything today or this month? Um, what were in our wins of the month were actually able to share kind of what they were able to learn from modifying and updating updating their codes. Uh, does anyone else have any, um, you know, it could be anything small milestone based when that you, that you, or that you learned, or is there anything within the nurse documentation that helped you, or do you have any recommendations for improvements as well? Does anyone maybe have a tip to share on using nurse? Yeah, Stephen? Yeah, I actually have a question. Um, we used to have a, a code to bind our CPU processes to cores. And has NUMA changed in the latest operating system? I hadn't been running for a while. And when I tried using that recently, I got a complaint about the uh, having a dash between a range of uh, CPU cores. And so what was the exact um, error that you got? Well, it's a, it's a NUMA control line that says, mm -hmm. you know, bind this process to these cores. And it basically said, you know, I don't recognize this format for range of cores. Okay, um, maybe we could communicate offline to make sure, sure. you're using the right flags for it, because mm -hmm. um, that could be what could just be the problem with that. But you should still be able to do physical um, binding to the CPU as well as memory binding for the, the allocated cores. I will talk to you later about it. Thanks. Okay, yeah, thank you for asking. Anyone else? Um, Anything that you learned or a tip? I could follow on from that. Yep, NUMA is still pretty important on Perlmutter. And we do have some pages talking about affinity. So I'll, I'll, I'll pick up some links to them and add them, add them to the chat. Awesome. That's a good, good catch if the NUMA control syntax has changed. We might need to tweak some documentation. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, Steve. Okay. All right. Well, we'll continue on. Um, I think next we have our um, announcements and Lippy. I can yeah, pass sure. it over to you. Awesome. Okay. So um, just this is information that's all available in the weekly emails that have been going out um, as well as the announcement emails. Um, but just as a reminder to everybody that the that Corey is now scheduled to be retired on May 31st um, at noon. Um, please be aware that um, you'll still be able to log in on the login nodes and you'll be able to access the Scratch system for one week after that until Wednesday, June 7th. Um, but it's important that you move your data over to Perlmutter or to another um, place where you have access to it. Um, if you need to move from Cori Scratch to Perlmutter Scratch, you can use Globus and there's information about which endpoints to use and also how to use Globus if you haven't yet. Um, you can find it in the docs page. Um, we, we suggest that you use the community file system, CFS, for any data that you retrieve kind of regularly. Um, if you have large amounts of data that are not retrieved as often, potentially, um, it, I, I think this can still be accessed pretty frequently, but just maybe it's more like long-term storage. Um, you can use HPSS tape archive. Um, and there is a lot of information um, in the weekly email, as well as in the announcement emails about the best way to do this transfer. Um, and so I would recommend that you uh, either reach out if you need help, um, you can submit a ticket and ask for help with this uh, moving your data, or you can check out those um, documentation pages for the best way to move large amounts of data. 
Um, please remember in general, scratch storage is not permanent. Things are removed from scratch regularly. Um, and so any data that needs to be backed up, it's something that's uh, re irreplaceable, it needs to be on, on CFS or HPSS. Um, so again, if you have any questions, um, if you need help, uh, please, uh, the best way to do that is to submit a ticket through ServiceNow. Um, you can also attend the Cori to Perlmutter office hours. There's going to be several in the month of May, but the next one is on May 2nd. Um, and you can find all of those on the NERSC public events calendar. Um, so if you need help or if you can't find those, you can also submit a ticket um, to get information about that. Um, as per usual, please check out the docs pages for information about how to use Perlmutter. Um, so these Cori to Perlmutter office hours are also a good way if you're if you've been <laughs> relying on Corey and things aren't working as you expect on Perlmutter, please go to the office hours to get help. Um, great. Okay, so um, I guess, does anyone have any questions about this before we move on to some regular ones? Koichi, do you have a question? Uh, yes, uh, just curious. How does Scratch Space on Perlmutter compares with the, that one on Corey? Is that larger overall size? Um, so I believe the scratch allocation per person is the same on the, on both of them, but um, maybe someone can confirm that. Steve? Yes. Uh, so everybody has a 20 terabyte scratch allocation on Perlmutter. Scratch is faster. It's an all SSD system. Um, we don't yet have the ability for um, quota increases on Perlmutter like we do on Cori. I think that's planned eventually, but um, it's, it's not in place yet. So it does mean that if you have a, like a, a larger than normal quota, uh, you may need to back up some data to HPSS. Uh, okay. The other thing I wanted to remind people about HPSS, if your data is in the format of lots of small files, don't put it on there directly. Use something like HTAR or TAR to bundle it into larger files. And there's some notes on that in the docs that were on the, on the previous slide. Okay, so I so some kind of follow up related question is that uh, so I mean for the first question about the size I asked because is Parameter faster you know runtime and then faster I/O I'm producing even more data more quickly so I tend to run out of my scratch space more quickly than on Cori so I was thinking to increase my my quota on Parameter. And the other question is that when we move data from Cori Scratch to Parameter Scratch, that doesn't bring Stripe setting automatically to Parameter Scratch, right? For example, if I have Cori Scratch Space directory that has 24 stripes set up and then move whole directory to Parameter using Glover, then does anyone know if the stripe setting for the last file system simply becomes default on the parameter side? So to answer your first question, you can request um, an increase in um, your quota um, using it via ticket. Um, okay. So you can submit a ticket to do that. I, I don't have the answer to your second question. I'm not familiar with that. Um, Maybe Steve or Rebecca, if they're on, will have more. I mean, I can tell you that the stripe size doesn't change unless you manually change it. So you you're not going to get it from Corey to Perlmutter unless you set the stripe size on Perlmutter. Oh, okay. So it comes that information just moves together with the file itself. Uh, um, you have to set the stripe size on the directory before you copy the file into it, or else it doesn't yeah. stick. Does anybody create the directory before you get on to Globus by hand and set the stripe size as what was being said, and then it should work fine. Oh, okay. So I don't need to reset on the Perlmutter side. No, you, no, do. you, you, you do, do need to set it on Perlmutter. So oh, okay. I do you need get to. into okay. Globus, log into Perlmutter, create the directory where you want the data to go. It could be your top level scratch directory. It could be a, a subdirectory of it, then immediately do LFS, set stripe minus C, the number you want, and the name of that directory. 
and then get into Globus and start moving the data. And you can, you know, ask it on the individual files whether they're striped the way you want, and they should be. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Steve, did you want to ask something? Okay. Okay. Sorry, well, was it me? Oh. Uh, I thought you. I thought you were asking a question or something. So. Uh, no, I think I raised my hand to say something earlier, but I think I already said it. Oh, okay, good, good. Okay, awesome. Thank you for everybody to uh, answer those questions. That's great. Um, okay, so again, if you need more help, please submit a ticket. That's really going to be the best way to get um, all the help you need. Um, okay, awesome. All right, so um, just to highlight a couple of upcoming seminars, events, and trainings. Um, so the Cody training is happening currently. Um, this, um, you can get more information on the trainings website um, at nurse.gov. So this is the link to it. Um, there's day two tomorrow. So if you missed day one, you might be able to catch day two. Um, there's a PHP update that's coming up soon. Um, so if you use PHP um, for any of your applications, um, please make sure that you uh, update it and uh, check if it works. If you need help with that, there's some information at these links. Again, this is from the weekly email, so you can find these links in the weekly email, um, or you can uh, submit a ticket if you need further help with that. Um, there is an ECP seminar coming up. Uh, this is going to be presented by Paul Kent at Oak Ridge National Lab. That's on Wednesday, May 10th, uh, which is about uh, developing performance portable uh, QMC pack. Um, which I don't know what that is, but if you know what that is and if that's helpful for you, um, please find the link uh, in the weekly email. And just as a reminder, the weekly email is jam-packed with events and event um, trainings and seminars. So these are just a couple that are kind of coming up soon, um, but you can find even more in that email. Um, and then also these are some calls for participation. So um, there's a student cluster competition info session. So this takes place, I think, at SC. Uh, but the info session, um, so this one probably passed already, but there's another one on Thursday. Um, so if you have uh, questions or you want to find out more about what this student cluster competition is, uh, please make sure to check this out. Um, again, the link is in the weekly email. And um, uh, the Fortran user group um, uh, is looking for some uh, feedback about uh, LLVM flying. Um, so they have a survey here. Uh, this link is also in the um, weekly email. And lastly, NERSC is looking for some feedback about the message of the day website. So this is a web page on nurse.gov where we post the NERSC status. So it's where you can find out if Corey's up or promoters up and uh, various other systems, and we're looking into making that a little bit more accessible. So please um, uh, use this survey if you have thoughts on how to make this message of the day um, better and more useful for you. Uh, that will be really important. Um, okay, so I think we are ready for today's uh, topic of the day, which is a presentation by Johannes. Um, can someone confirm Johannes joined. I know he had to jump between meetings. So. I am here. I'm here. Oh, good. Yay. So uh, Johannes. Yeah, no worries. No worries. Um, Johannes is, um, uh, well, I guess I don't know what your position is. Uh, <laughs> I've just, I've just known you. Johannes has just been a fixture at NERSC since I joined um, uh, as an all-around expert, uh, but in particular as a Julia expert. Um, so he's been doing a lot of work at getting uh, Julia up and ready for people to use at NERSC, um, and he's kind of the expert at it um, at NERSC. So he's going to tell us more about the language, what it's used for, and maybe, maybe if we're lucky, do a demo. Yeah. Uh, Yay! Awesome. Did you want me to show your slides and then? Uh, maybe you can switch over to my screen and yeah. uh, then okay, so I have to show a demo anyway. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing and you can oh. go ahead. Okay, I am going to share my screen. Uh should see my screen here, right? Yep. All right, brilliant. Well, um, uh, thank you. Uh, that was, I was a bit, bit too flattered there. So, um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to just give a, um, uh, just going to talk uh, informally, actually, about uh, Julia uh, and, and Juliet Nurse in particular. 
<clears throat> so if you have questions, I'm keeping an eye on the time. Uh, so, so there's no danger in running over. Um, uh, so if you have any questions, please just um, ask. Um, it's better than uh, than just putting something in the chat. And, and if anyone sees a question in the chat that I should be answering that I'm not seeing, uh, please let me know. Um, so <clears throat> um, I always like to show some introduction slides about the Julia language because I think um, it's one of those languages that are, you know, languages like uh, C, Fortran, and Python don't need much inter introducing. Um, and, and Julia still needs a little bit of introducing, especially uh, in the HPC community. Um, and so uh, I, I always like to start the story with um, a slide from Cray from HPE. And, and what they've done is they've kind of taken this little survey. It's mainly intended to promote their language chapel down here, but it, it accidentally also promotes Julia. And so what they've done is they've kind of plotted, um, they've compared the um, uh, code size with the execution time. And so the idea is if you're down here in this corner, it, it means that you need very little code to produce very fast programs. Um, and so, uh, so you can see we've, we've got a, a variety of languages here and, and maybe the general trend is, um, uh, you know, languages like, I'm trying, trying to find, uh, excuse me. Oh yeah, here we go. C I think is black. Um, so languages like C uh, can achieve pretty high speeds, but but you have to put in a lot of code. Um, and the idea is, you know, Julia um, is down here, so it, it produces a fast code, but it can do so with significantly less uh, boilerplate. Um, the other thing, and I think this is my, maybe even more important than the verbos verbosity of, of a language, is the community. Um, and, and this is the main reason why I actually advocate for Julia for HPC, is because the community is HPC aware, more so than, for example, Python. Um, and so I think it produces uh, a, um, uh, a, a high performance, um, high, high performance, high productivity langu uh, language um that has a community that that is able to engage with you very readily uh, when you go and say well i'm running on frontier or i'm running on perlmutter and i'm seeing weird behavior you'll probably in the forums get oh yeah i'm also doing this and here this is what i did uh, to make it work um <clears throat> now to switch a little bit more to the technicality uh, and and language design um if you if you start to look at uh some of the discussions around um high productivity, high performance languages, you'll frequently um, see this sort of issue that's levied against um, Python, which is it's great until you can't uh, work within the restrictions of the package that you're using. And this is really a problem of front ends versus back ends. It, it often requires a lot of work to become a back end developer. Uh, and so if you, for example, want to create your own really weird loss function in PyTorch, uh, that you can't just express um, in the in the PyTorch um, packages that are available, you'll find it's very hard. Um, oops, it's very hard to do uh, and and keep performance. Another benchmark that we've we've worked on is um, just the uh, the cost of switching between a front end and a back end. So here are different function signatures, and uh, if you use uh, if if you use something like PyBind eleven or um, just the the uh, Python um, CAPI, um, then just making this function call actually costs some time. Um, and if if you use a language like Julia, um, because it is actually using a JIT compiler behind the scenes, so your Julia code gets uh, um, produces um, LLVM intermediate representation code. And that code just uses the C API, so the C ABI to, to make the function call. Um, you can see you've got pretty much, a, 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 you can see up to a hundred times speed up just making that function call. Um, now you might ask, you might say, well, function calls aren't that, that big a deal, right? Like I make it one off, but once again, it, it locks you into a, um, a framework where you use the high productivity language really only to coordinate your work and then all the and, and then once you're in the C uh, substrate, so to speak, you kind of trap there because every time you jump between the two, you're paying a penalty. Um, 
And in case you are, you're thinking, oh, well, nobody uses Julia, um, I, I want to point out. Um, so we've been, uh, we've, um, uh, been working on this uh, paper here um, that uh, just like I like to show, there are many different uh, co-authors here from many different centers around the world. And if you even just uh, poll the folks at NERSC, you can see that about half um, of NERSC users um, have the, the intent to, to actually use Julia. Um, so, well, half of the people that responded to the survey, but still those responses to the survey were, were pretty, um, uh, there were a lot of responses. So I think this is uh, as it was a representative as a survey can get. And finally, I'd like to just always point out, uh, I love the Julia language itself. It has some neat features. Um, when you start, you might think, uh, you know, what, what the hell is this? But then as you get involved deeper, you realize, oh no, this is really neat stuff. And, and I've actually had this experience myself where I keep, uh, when I dive into uh, something like a Python uh, application, it becomes, um, you realize that uh, it's um, sometimes not designed with HPC in mind. I'm not dissing on Python, by the way. I, I realize I am, but uh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Uh, I like uh, what I'm saying is that for different applications, uh, there are different strengths. And for HPC code, uh, I strongly suggest that if you are looking for a high level language, give Julia a try. All right. So, some, uh, I'm, I'm not seeing any chat, by the way. Okay, good. Uh, so, um, uh, so, some, some news. Uh, about Julia at NERSC. Um, so uh, we are aware that the current Julia models on, on Perlmutter are a bit broken. This is because um, both HPE uh, do, uh, are changing a lot of things, th things behind the scenes, but also the Julia ecosystem is moving very quickly, um, which means that the model of providing pre-built environments um, isn't really working. Even though the Julia language and API are stable, just the fact that you know having to rebuild uh, Julia envi environments all the time makes it very difficult uh, to, to keep, keep on top of it. And therefore we are moving away from having a nurse provided environment and set, just make it very easy for you to do the right thing uh, when you're setting up your own environments. Um, I see a chat, I'm just waiting on it. Okay, uh, and so, um, uh, so, so in this, in this, uh, along those lines, there are basically two uh, pull requests that um, one of them is already merged. The other one is uh, on the verge of being merged. Um, the first one is um, MPI and the, what's called the GPU transport layer has been causing some problems, which required some hacks. Uh, and and very soon they won't be needed anymore. So uh, very soon, in fact, if you use the the branch in the pull request here, you can just run uh, MPI preferences dot use system library and you say vendor equals cray, MPI executable equals S run. And it will automatically find all the right things to do and um, your MPI install um, will work perfectly. Um, and then also uh, for setting up, uh, for, for getting Julia, I've been working with some uh, of the Julia app developers and uh, Julia, the tool is now HPC friendly, which allows you to um, uh, very easily um, pick the version of Julia that you would like and have it uh, um, in your environment and, and work well. Um, okay, I'm just double checking the message Oops, messages. Uh, Okay, I, uh, the comments about Jax versus Julia maybe a little later, but I do have thoughts, and and I think uh, you know I think this is an interesting uh, point. Uh, and um, uh, then the other question is, can Julia do GPO offloading to NVIDIA and AMD GPUs? Yes, it can. Uh, um, uh, I don't know the auto dial capability. But um, actually, I think I have a link to it at the end. Um, there's something called kernelabstractions.jl. And that's a, a oh, autodiff. Yes. Oh, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. So um, uh, you can write application portable GPU code. Uh, in fact, there's a Gordon Bell submission this year uh, that does exactly that. So a single Julia code that runs on AMD and uh, NVIDIA GPUs. And yes, Julia, the way that Julia is designed, I might make another presentation later about uh, differentiable programming. 
uh, and um, look for uh, scigoat.jl. Uh, but actually, the Julia language itself is built in such a way that um, differentiable programming is, is very, very easy. Um, and in fact, I have examples of this in, in some of the links I'm showing. Oops, I'm just going to go back. Uh, and then finally, uh, I just wanted to point out um, in terms of news, um, this, this is still a work in progress, um, but right now, um, another way that uh, a brand new supercomputer likes to mess up your plans is um, it will uh, expose a completely new way of talking to um, uh, the network. And this is true uh, for Slingshot as well. So right now, this is this, this what I've considered an awful hack where you need to tell Julia um, which uh, adapter to um, which NIC to bind to, <clears throat> and this is now uh, this won't be necessary. We are we are working, uh, um, and if you're interested in actually helping us with that, um, that would be great. Um, but uh, our work at the moment is to use HW lock to bind to the correct to the right NIC for the high speed network. All right, and um, we, we already uh, mentioned some, some nice capabilities. Uh, I want to um, point out that there is a, um, uh, this year there was for the ECP community days, a tutorial and a buff on Julia. Everything uh, in that uh, is available on the, uh, on the following GitHub page, um, including uh, some slides, uh, for example, of things like uh, automatic differentiation. Uh, and and automatic GPU offloading. Um, I wasn't. Uh, I, I didn't highlight an automatic GPU offloading example. Uh, instead, I wanted to highlight something that's a little bit less well-known example for the the folks that enjoy the way that um, Fortran does arrays. I, um, Julia does it in the same way. So um, uh, one of the presentations at that uh, uh, tutorial was integrating. Um, machine learning into a Fortran application. And what they actually found is it was easier for them to port their Fortran code to Julia and then use uh, the flux.jl uh, uh, Julia package to do um, um, machine learning uh, in situ for the application. And I really like this slide because it really shows, you know, here, here's your Fortran loop structure. So a triply nested loop as, as frequently we, we tend to do. Um, and you know it's 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 pretty much like a conservation, uh, like a finite volume conservation law uh, stencil. And and here we have the same thing in Julia. And you can see pretty much the same thing. You just have to change your your array index brackets to square brackets, um, and you don't have to worry about the line breaks as much. <clears throat> but but Julia arrays are Fortran ordered, and they started one. So in that sense, uh, it's it's very much the same deal. All right, um, just making sure. Uh, yeah, so I think the first, I can start the first demo. Uh, when people start working in, in Julia, I, they frequently overlook the package management uh, infrastructure that, that Julia has. And I wanted to just uh, demonstrate that uh, and what better place but to use Jupyter for that. So I'm just gonna stop the screen uh, here and uh, try and find it in my many tabs. So you should see my Jupyter screen. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Brilliant. All right. So, uh, so um, if you if you were on Jupyter, you can click on any of these kernels. Um, as I said, some uh, we we are going to add Ju Julia up to this, and then you can just come with your own favorite version of Julia. Um, and then, if I was to start one of these um, uh, kernels, in this case, Julia one point eight. Uh, so first thing, I, I'm just going to create myself a temporary directory, and I'm just going to go to that temporary directory, and, and I'm going to print my working directory just to make sure where I am. So here, this is a, a temporary uh, empty space. I can even confirm that it's empty. Semicolon runs a shell command in Jupyter uh, for, for using the Julia kernel. And I can just run the tree command, and you can see there, there are zero directories and zero files. I'm going to import the package. Um, package, the PKG package. And I want to create a blank package. And I want to uh, highlight the fact that uh, if you are building an application, you should be working within a package. It shouldn't just be a bunch of source files thrown together in a directory. Packages allow Julia to 
uh, Marshall uh, pre-compilation um, uh, correctly. Um, so, and I'm gonna run the package.generate and I'm gonna look at my tree again. And you can see now it's done several things. It's gonna, it's created a my package directory and it's put a TOML file in here and it's going and, and it uh, put, you know, just a, a little source file. Um, uh, um, you know, it's a bit silly. We could even like go and just have a, have a look at it um, and it would be my package source my package.jl it's really kind of boring it's just an empty module with a hello world um and then you could start editing right um and that that um is um it did two things it it, it created a self-contained environment for your source code but also put this project.toml so let's see what what this one of these does i'm going to create a, another empty uh uh temporary directory. I'm going to see there's nothing there. I'm going to now use package.activate and oops, and this join path is unnecessary, by the way. I can just go and I'm going to activate the package at my current location. That's what this at dir does. I'm going to add two, two packages to this um, environment. So this is it's a little bit like pip activate if you were to use Python. Um, it takes a moment and it says, I'm going to add all of these plus dependencies. And I'm going to take a look. And now I've got a manifest.toml and a project.toml. I'm going to take a look at the project.toml. And you can see, see what the project.toml is for. It, it keeps track of the precise version of all the dependencies that your, your environment has. So a package is basically source code plus an environment. And that way you can put all your dependencies together with your source code in, in, in one package. Um, and that avoids confusions uh, later down the line. Um, I also want to point out some HPC considerations at this at this stage. Um, you, if you want to use um, uh, Julia at scale, I highly recommend that you look at the package dot, package compiler um, project. And that can now take your package object and turn it into a single shared object file called a sysimage. Um, and uh, if you then combine that with Podman HPC, um, you could create an image that has all the dependencies and all the pre-compiled code together with your, um, with your Julia application inside that image. That's the recommended approach. If you can't pre-compile everything, you know, this might not be feasible. Then I suggest that you create a um, Julia compile cache on your scratch directory and you mount that into your image and you make sure that your Julia depot path environment variable inside the image points to that compile cache because that's the place where Julia looks to, to uh, pre-compile things. Uh, and that way you are pre-compiled, your, your LLVM intermediate representation code is on scratch. I'm seeing questions. I'm just going to double check. OK, I have a, a list. I'm, I'm going to end my talk very soon with a list of um, cool packages to look at. Um, I think plotting isn't one of them, but I'm going to mention where to find plotting. And, and people are uh, already answering. Great. Now, I, I really want to show this example. How much time do we have, Libby, by the way? I would say another uh, five to seven minutes, and then we'll just wrap up. Brilliant. Oops, this is the wrong one. Uh, yes. Ex ex um, so that that lets lets me show the thing that I really care about in in uh, Julia, which is uh, it has someone already mentioned in the chat. Uh, it has a lot of applied math uh, stuff in, in in natively, but it also has parallelism natively, and so um, I want to show you distributed the package. So let me just start that. Now distributed gives you a workers command and you can even take a look at that and it says, well, you've got one worker. So let's let's add a whole lot more workers. <laughs> okay, give it a moment. So this is a bit of a contrived example, but we don't have much time. And so um, so let's say now now we've, now I've added eight workers to my pool of workers. Um, Actually, queried workers, you can see I've now an eight element array. 
Now let's say I, I, I want to do something kind of stupid, like uh, uh, toss a uh, coin many times. And here I have a serial implementation of the number of heads function and a distributed implementation. You can see that at distributed will distribute your for loop content and everything inside the bracket here is your reduction function. So if I define this and I ran these, um, I'm gonna let those run in the background uh, while I explain. So basically um, these now are now running first uh, serial and then a parallel example. Um, and it's, it's creating these benchmarks. This is what benchmark tools, the package does. It shows you a little histogram of the run times and it gives you some statistics. And in a moment, we'll see that, uh, you know, using eight workers instead of um, uh, um, uh, one for this uh, conveniently parallel example uh, gives you uh, almost 10 times speed up. Now we're not done yet. Julia can also talk to Slurm. So if I now go and in include cluster managers, and we can ask, what does the Slurm manager look like? You can see, well, it takes number of uh, processes. Uh, okay, so I can now go and define a Slurm manager and it, it's gonna take, give me 128 workers. And I'm gonna give it the Slurm um, argument. So I'm gonna uh, submit to the CPU queue using, um, so the debug queue using the CPU partition and I'm gonna grab two nodes. Start that, and actually, in the meantime, I'm going to open a terminal and show you what's happening with SQS. And you can see, I have a uh, I've, I've just queued my job from Jupyter, and it's gonna it's gonna take a moment. Hopefully, I, I tried it earlier. Uh, it's okay. Well, what you should be seeing is uh, eventually, uh, when when it's done, you are going to drop into, it's, um, it's gonna release control, and then you can run your job on multiple nodes using distributed. <clears throat> and, uh, and I don't have a GPU example. I think uh, a GPU is, is something, uh, it's also fairly portable, but you know, GPU is a little bit more difficult. Uh, so, so maybe I will in the future also uh, give an example of using GPU programming. I'm gonna, while we're waiting, Oh yeah, Julia Stats is, is wonderful. I'm, I thank you, uh, Arjun, for for uh, fielding some questions. Okay, actually, last time this really didn't take very long, and and maybe oh no, here we go. We've got our nodes. Brilliant. Okay, now we've we've connected to our workers. Yeah, we can we can uh, query each individual worker using the spawnet command, um, and then we can see what their host names are. And I'm actually also going to rerun my parallel example, but now I'm going to rerun it on two nodes using 128 workers. Um, uh, I've, the previous example, I only used a few workers. So um, this is actually, I maybe shouldn't have changed my demo uh, too much, but still running. Yes. Okay. So it's going to take a moment. Um, I'm kind of surprised. Maybe there's an issue. All right. Uh, this is the this is what happens when you when you change a demo uh, on the fly. Um, I I just put ten before, and now I thought, oh well, I can do 128. It's a much nicer number. Okay. This is this is taking a time uh, to to really spread the work across the network, um, uh, and then uh, oh here we go, and so um, it's. Uh, it's collected the host names from, from every um, worker. And you can see we've got NIDs repeated until uh, we've got 64 of them. And then we've got another 64 here. And now running the benchmark tools. And here we go, this is what I wanna show you. And now because we've got two nodes going at it, really going full pelt at it, we have decreased our speed, uh, runtime from by another factor 10, basically from 48 down to about five. All right, and that's pretty much the uh, getting to the end. Uh, I will just leave this up. Uh, the, these slides are shared anyway. Um, 
So for for all your HPC needs, I suggest you look at these packages here. Uh, for plotting, I recommend a package called Plots. It's just that. Um, and uh, for um, uh, AI work, I recommend you look into Flux. Flux is uh, in Flux at the moment, so um, you might need to debug some of the older examples, but it's actually a really cool tool. Uh, so, and with that, I yield my time. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, feel free to continue asking some questions. And if you have time, uh, maybe Johannes, are you able to stick around for a couple minutes? I am. And, and I'm going to ask you, how, how should I share? I, I'm happy to share those notebooks, um, but I don't know how to add them to the presentation. Yes, we let's work on that um, so that people can get access to those. Thank you. Um, OK, well, let's wrap up. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry. Slideshow. OK, um, so we have um, several more. Uh, we have these meetings every month. We've got some good topics coming up in the future. Um, that'll include a presentation on Jupiter Hub at NERSC, um, some more NERSC tips and tricks. Um, we're going to have a presentation from security at some point, tell us more about how security at NERSC works. Um, so please uh, stay tuned for those. Um, and in general, we'd love to learn more from, from you all. Um, if you have things that you'd like to present, we'd love to work with you on that. Um, so if you have any thoughts, please feel to uh, please feel free to um, submit those to us via this QR. So the QR code is to this form here. Uh, that will take you to a place where you can nominate a topic or uh, suggest a topic. Um, and then also remember, if you are uh, working on some cool science and you have anything you'd like us to highlight or uh, make us aware of something you did at NERSC, we have this highlight submission form. Uh, please spread this to your students, to your co uh, colleagues, co uh, collaborators. We always want to hear about what people are working on at NERSC. Um, and Charles, did you want to add anything? I think you got everything pretty covered. We're just looking forward to uh, an engaging and interactive year. So, yeah. Awesome. Great. Thanks, everybody. Uh, feel free to stick around if you want to talk to Johannes anymore, but otherwise we will see you next month. Hey, see if you want to. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye. Yeah, that's a quick question about the Julia. Um, just curious if Julia is more popular to certain kind of science communities like I don't know it was well, more like it's very broad across any disciplines right um so there is a monthly uh Julia so th there's a Julia HPC working group that meets monthly um and I think it is a very nice cross-section of both different data centers at some point I want to make a little map you know, world map, um, uh, you know, you know, from Europe, uh, um, we have, we, we really, the only place we don't really have much representation is, is Central Asia. Um, so, so maybe if to find someone at Kaust or something, uh, but yeah, we have, um, many data centers where HPC is uh, traditionally, um, and, um, the, the science that's being done there is it's a simulation data analysis. Uh, applied math is one of those areas that have taken to Julia fairly early on because of the way it does arrays. Um, and, and AI research actually is also starting to grow because Flux is reaching maturity. Um, so it's, it's very diverse, basically. Um, I can't think of any topic that... Um, uh, that I work with uh, here at NERSC that I don't know someone who's actually also using Julia on. So for example, um, there's one group that's a cosmology group at Berkeley and they're using um, Julia to solve PDEs, but also to analyze data. So there's a, uh, it's very diverse uh, in, yeah. in, in the science. 
Great. Yeah, thank you very much for a really nice demonstration. I'll look into more uh, myself from those links. So I really appreciate it. Glad to hear. And, and if you have any other questions, uh, you know, let me know. Um,